Welcome back to Supreme Miss. I am excited today to have as my special guest, David Daly. He is a journalist. He is the former editor-in-chief of Salon. He has written several books. He is currently a senior fellow at Fair Vote. He is an important uh, commentator on today's elections and politics. And his brand new book, we're taping this on Monday. I believe his book is coming out on Tuesday uh, or sometime this week, I hope. It's called Anti-Democratic, Inside the Far Right Paul Wright's 50-year plot to control American elections. It is a great book. Everybody should buy it. I just read it, and we're going to talk about it today. David, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Eric. Really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. So before we start on your great book, I do have to tell a personal story. I am sorry. <laughs> um, back, back in 2016, I organized the largest conference of my academic life. It was called Invisible Justices. And we talked about recusal, ethics, cameras, the root of certiary, a bunch of other things. And I worked really, really hard. And I promised my family that as it closes on Friday afternoon, I will put my phone away for the weekend. We got a house in the mountains and we went away for a family vacation with no law. On yeah. Saturday afternoon, my wife and I are playing Monopoly with my teenage kids. And my phone is in, my phone is gone. My phone is in a drawer off. My wife's phone is on and she gets a call from a friend who says, what does Eric think about Scalia? I then said, I guess I better open my phone because we didn't know what it was. We found out the justice had died. And there are, there's you in my email saying, call me. I do. And you say, I need a thing about Scalia tonight. When can you get it to me for Salon? Because you're the editor in chief. I said, David, I will write a thing about Scalia tonight for you, but I will not be mean. I, I, I am Scalia's biggest critic, I believe. Um, but, but on this day, I'm going to say nice things and just honor the man. You said, that's, that's fine. We can come back later and do other things, which we did, you and I. <laughs> we can um, be mean later. But I will tell you that to this day, my wife and two kids don't like you very much because, because you took me away from the Monopoly game. So that's what happened. I, I apologize to your wife and family for that. Um, I'm still apologizing to my family for the five years I had to run salon. I was not yes. around very much. It, was, it well, was the same thing. Imagine that on every single news story. And it yeah, was, I, I can't. Yes. Uh, you it were, was a wonderful platform, but it yes. was exhausting. Yes. All right. So your book, I'm going to repeat the title, Anti-Democratic, Inside the Far Right's 50-Year Plot to Control American Elections. Why did you write this book? What that you've written two other books that touch on these issues. So why this book? Well, those other two books didn't get me on this podcast talking to you. <laughs> so, you know, now I've um, <laughs> you've always been welcome on this podcast. But go ahead. <laughs> um, I wrote this book because I had written previous books about redistricting. Um, I had written one uh, with the title of Rat uh, Eft rhymes with duct. <laughs> um, that was sort of all about um, Red Map, a Republican strategy to win state legislatures ahead of uh, the 2010 census and the redistricting that followed. Um, and what happened um, after that very successful strategy, Republicans took over state legislatures across the South, across the Midwest that they had never controlled before. And once you gerrymander yourself into really uncompetitive seats, one of the things that happens is your caucus becomes more radical uh, because the election that matters is no longer the the general election, but the party primary. And maybe nobody shows up for that June election and 22% is enough to elect right. some real nuts. Um, and right. what you begin to see coming out of state legislatures across the South uh, and across much of the country um, is an entire array of new operations and, and, and methods designed uh, to manicure or suppress the vote. Um, and much of this, not all of it, but much of it was made possible by the Roberts Court's decision in Shelby County in 2013 that put an end to preclearance. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, but go ahead. Yeah. Finish your thoughts uh, so, we'll, so what we'll I wanted to, to do, so 
it, it, it seemed to me that if you wanted to tell the story of what has happened to American politics and how our politics became so extreme and radicalized over the course of the last decade, that one important piece of this was the redistricting story. But yeah. the other piece of the story was how the courts allowed it and how the two have acted as accelerants on each other how the decisions by the Roberts court have opened up the doors of state legislatures to go further and further and more extreme. And then in turn, how, how, uh, um, uh, it's worked the other way around. And, um, it's as if a, a Gordian knot has been, has been tied around, yeah. around not just voting rights, but also, uh, policy. If you look at things, like abortion rights, um, in which the court will issue a decision in Dobbs that says, well, we're not overruling Roe here so much as we are returning this issue to the people and their elected representatives. Well, they're returning the issue to people and elected representatives and legislatures that they've allowed to be radically partisan gerrymandered. Um, and so the will of the people in those states doesn't really matter. And so what I wanted to do was try to explore the other side of this, to explore what has happened to the courts, not just over the course of the last decade, but really over the course of the last 50 years to put Republicans in this position um, where the combination of control of the courts and control over state legislatures has really resulted in what I fear is an enduring form of minority rule in much of the country. Yeah, I think that that's well put. Um, so your book, and by the way, I should tell the audience, we can only cover a microscopic portion of this rich book. It really is a rich book. Every page is has important things on it. Um, so th there's two different paths in this book basic big paths. One involves voting rights and one involves money in elections. Um, and you and you handle both and they interweave, they're related to each other. Um, so we're going to have to keep those two things a little bit separate. So you would just, so we're going to talk mostly about Shelby County and voting rights, but your book starts off talking about a 1971 memorandum written by Justice Lewis F. Powell, who history views as a moderate. It, it really does. I don't think that's an accurate representation, but that's what history says. This 1971 memorandum, I think, is the kickoff of the end of the war in court era and the beginning of what we see today. And I think you agree with that. So tell tell my audience about that memo, why it's so important and why it's been and why it has been so important for the last yeah. 50 years. No, I think that's exactly right. Um, Lewis Powell, uh, at the time that he is writing this memo uh, is a corporate lawyer in Virginia. He's on the boards of you know, Philip Morris. Uh, he's um, the former uh, uh, chairman of the school boards in in Richmond, Virginia. And he has the, the reputation as sort of a courtly centrist Southern gentleman um, and was memorialized in his obituaries really as, as, as sort of the court's genial... Um, right. Uh, Southern uh, uh, presence, an important bridge uh, from the Old South into the New South. And Powell simply is not that at all. <laughs> um, fake news. It's called fake news. It, it couldn't be any wronger. Um, yeah. I'm sure he had a lovely personality, um, but Powell um, is, is, is the chair of the school boards in Richmond after Brown versus a board of education comes down and Richmond's schools were wildly segregated. Um, and Lewis Powell simply didn't understand the decision. He not only thought it was wrong, uh, he just fundamentally didn't get how this was possible. Um, and schools in Richmond, even though, you know, Powell did not go down the path of maximal resistance um, as other places in the South m might have, but he just slow walked it to the extent that when he left office five years later, uh, there were only a handful of black students in white schools in Richmond. 
Um, and Powell spends the 1960s um, on uh, a rhetorical terror against Martin Luther <laughs> King, against civil rights, um, none of which makes his obituaries, um, and is 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 just so concerned about about um, the culture of protest in America, the, the the state of college campuses during Vietnam, um, the March on Washington. The, the, the gathering momentum and moral force of the civil rights movement. And um, he's having these talks with his neighbor in Virginia, and it leads to what has become known as the Powell Memo that he writes for the Chamber of Commerce um, just before he goes on the court uh, in 1971, just before Nixon appoints him and, and Bill Rehnquist on the same day. Um, and history sees those two as very different, but I would I would suggest that uh, in, uh, in 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 manner of their opinions on uh, on racial issues, they were both very much the same. Um, and what Powell writes is that the courts have become this basically an underused uh, piece of of the battle for America, and that and that corporate America and the right and big business um, had to realize that if 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 they wanted to change the country, the way to do this was through the courts. And what it did was it it really set forth a blueprint for CEOs to invest uh, in efforts to um, inject this kind of free market fundamentalism, not only into the courts, but um, to you know build new political think tanks in Washington. And what you saw were the 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 Koch brothers and the Coors family and um, all of these big funders on the right, Scaife and Olin, um, using the Powell memo uh, to try to counter the gains that had been won by consumer rights and environmental advocates and to do so through the courts. Um, and I think a lot of folks on the left like to see this memo as sort of providing a roadmap um, that was followed perfectly and completely. It's not it's not that. It's not a silver bullet, but um, it certainly was an inspiration. Um, what I find in this book as well is is a is a much more, uh, I think, quietly influential memo, one that was written by Michael Horowitz um, uh, for the Scaife Foundation a few years later. And what Horowitz says, David, is hold on that, one second. David, yeah. hold on. We'll get to that. But I want I want to talk about Powell for a second. Hold on one second. Yes. Um, so uh, you know the, the Justice Powell of nineteen seven of nineteen sixty and certainly nineteen seventy one. I think we can. I'm sorry, nineteen seventy one, but certainly nineteen sixty. We can concede by nineteen eighty, he's somewhat different. He has evolved a little bit. Um, and I'll give you the example. You said Rehnquist and he were similar on racial issues. They were similar, but but they were also far apart. Powell did allow affirmative action in the Harvard way of doing things uh, in Bakke, whereas Rehnquist would not have allowed affirmative action ever. Um, and I, I do think to give that Powell, my guess is in 1960 Richmond, Virginia, he probably was moderate by the standards of 1960 <laughs> Virginia, which is very conservative, I think. Um, well, uh, yeah. and, you know, what I would say to that um, is I think we're – I think we need to consider the Powell of Mo Mobile v. Bolden as well. Um, and I, I dive deep into Mobile in yes. this book because I think it's a really important case. In, well, tell the, in tell the audience. It, so, so let me just make this transition. Sure. The, the, the Powell memo did lead us eventually to a Citizens United world. And we may or may not have time to get into that today. Um, because the vote, I really want you here for voting rights, um, and they are of course related. Um, but but so the so the case you're about to discuss is not a case that we really teach in law school, and it's not a familiar case because it was effectively overruled um, by Congress. Go ahead and explain because it is super important to the lead up to Shelby County. It also reflects Justice Powell. So go ahead. Uh, so what happens across the South um, in the days after? after Reconstruction and after the Supreme Court in many ways helps undermine the, the Reconstruction dream uh, by effectively um, 
eviscerating the ability of 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 the federal government to police um uh states across the south and so states across the south begin to enforce new constitutions uh like alabama did in 1901 which they say was laid out in order to uh create white supremacy they don't walk they don't you know mince any words on this right. so right. Um, one of the ways that Alabama did this uh, was through the use of at-large districts. Um, so, so cities would elect their council at-large, which means that in a city like Mobile, Alabama, which was the second largest city uh, in Alabama by the uh, 1970s, uh, about 65% white, 35% black. Uh, and so what happens when you do that uh, is that whites win every single election. Um, and, and black Georgia has a long Georgia has a long history with that shenanigans as well. Go ahead. No. Um, so so it works. It works very well. Um, and by that point in time, this practice had been so evolved that people like Lewis Powell separated it entirely from its racial history. They simply didn't know or appreciate or understand that this was intentional. Uh, this, well, this is simply how we've always elected people. What do you mean? Um, and so Mobile, um, so so civil rights activists in Mobile uh, bring a challenge uh, to the practice of at-large uh, districts. Um, and there is a brave uh, federal judge in Alabama, Judge Pittman, and and it's it's an amazing case because because Pittman gets out of the courtroom and he walks around the city and he sees the white neighborhoods and the new sidewalks and the fancy schools and the police departments, uh, and then he walks over to the, the black neighborhoods and he 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 sees uh, that nothing is being kept up and nothing is being invested um, right. and walks through the history of segregation in Mobile and says. Uh, this is the reason why. And he says, you're going to have to change the way that Mobile City government works. You're going to have to have districts and not um, at large. And, not at large. Uh, and this goes to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, Mobile appeals the a decision. Uh, and Lewis Powell uh, does not write the decision. But I went through all of the papers and Lewis Powell is... Um, whispering in Potter Stewart's ear uh, every single step of the way on this case, pushing and prodding him um, to fight back harder and harder against Thurgood Marshall and the uh, decision that, 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 that and the uh, dissent that a Marshall has put forth. So, so the, the argument was this system violated the Voting Rights Act of 1964, which we're actually going to get into in depth in a second. Yeah. The court and, said it did, it did not violate the Voting Rights Act of 1964. That's right. Um, and Powell, in one of his letters to Stewart, um, you know, Stewart knew pornography when he saw it, but not, yes. Uh, yes. you know, racial gerrymandering. Um, and um, a Stewart, uh, a Powell writes Stewart on Supreme Court letterhead that if their side does not prevail in this case, our cities will become jungles. Um, and I think the racial coding there is just obvious and clear in any decade as far as what he actually meant by that. So to me, the Lewis Powell of 1980 is not that different from the Lewis Powell of 1960. And the reason this case bleeds into what I think we'll talk about next uh, is because when the Voting Rights Act has to be reauthorized in 1982, voting rights advocates say we have to effectively undo Mobile of E. Bolden in this reauthorization. There are forces within the United States Department of Justice that want to hold on to the led, Mobile. Led by, led by a young lawyer named John Roberts. Led by a young man named John Roberts. Okay. Uh, David, so hold on. One second here. First of all, on the on the on the jungle comment, um, <laughs> this, uh, we're going to get silly for ten seconds here. I mean, it's an awful statement for Powell to make, obviously, in full racism. You know what I've never understood about the world, David? <laughs> maybe maybe you can answer this question for me. This is not about law. I'm sorry for the digression. I don't understand. 
I don't understand how Bruce Springsteen got away with writing a song called Jungle Land about Harlem. I don't understand it. To this. I mean, the, the piano, the, the, the guitar, it's all, the musicality is great. How do we accept this today? Do you have a theory about this? You know, I mean, I've never thought about Jungle Land, but I think about turning Japanese by the vapors yeah. all the time. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't know how they get away. If anyone in the audience knows how Bruce Springsteen uh, got away with this, can someone let me know by email? Jungle by Springsteen. That's yes. that yes. one. I will never look at the Born to Run album exactly the same way. <laughs> right. Okay. Sorry for that digression. Um, so that Powell opinion in that case um, was one of many Supreme Court decisions that just didn't help voting rights in this country. Um, so let's go back a minute here. Um, the 15th Amendment prohibits discrimination in, in, on the basis of, of race when it comes to voting. The 14th Amendment, of course, re requires states not to deny equal protection of the law. Um, and the Supreme Court guts all of that for many, many years. So literacy tests and character tests, everyone knows the story. Um, black people were not allowed to vote in big parts of this country. Now, there were lawsuits, but every time a, 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 a lawsuit was won by the plaintiffs, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, whoever, would just change the law a little bit and the same result. So all of that leads to the passing of the Voting Rights Act of 1964, uh, five, excuse me, one of the most important laws ever in this country's history. And right after it's passed, South Carolina challenges it. I think we should start the story there. What did the court hold in South Carolina versus Katzenbach? Oh. You know, I mean, uh, yes. Um, and, and I think we have to jump back just a half step there sure. as well, um, because what the Voting Rights Act of 1965 recognized was that there had been systemic violent resistance to the Reconstruction Amendments that had been enabled in many ways by the U.S. Supreme Court uh, in the Cruikshank case and the civil rights cases. Um, that we saw what happened with regards to lynching and murders and literacy tests and poll taxes and white primaries and the like. The Civil Rights Act of 1957 comes into play uh, that begins to try to push back on this, but it required litigation to be heard in federal courts where the complaint was raised and that was no way to provide any oversight because too many of the judges themselves were segregationists. They wouldn't enforce the law. They slow walk the trials uh, in Dallas County where Selma is. They would protect the sheriffs. They deny the DOJ access to records. They stall the trials. And in the meantime, politicians would come up with new ways to uh, block the vote uh, faster than the old ones could be knocked exactly. down. Right. So well 1961, said. you've got 1% of blacks registered to vote in Dallas County. By 65, even after four years of all of these victories, you know, quote unquote victories, um, the, 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 the number of registered voters who are black in Dallas County is only up to 5%. Uh, so what the, the Voting Rights Act did was uh, it created a formula in Section 4 and a mechanism in Section 5 called preclearance that said the localities, the states, the counties that have got the worst records when it comes to resistance to what we've been trying to do with these Reconstruction Amendments for 100 years. If you want to make any additional changes to your uh, election laws, to your voting procedures, you're going to have to have them approved first before you make them by the federal government or by a court in Washington, D.C. Um, this becomes the key enforcement mechanism of the Voting Rights Act because they had because Congress had seen for a hundred years that without this kind of enforcement act, it simply there simply wouldn't be any teeth. Uh, and of course, because the amendment itself hands Congress the power to do whatever it feels it needs to do in order to enforce. What, what, what David is referring to there is Section Two of the Fifteenth Amendment. It says Congress can enforce Section 1, which is the prohibition of racial discrimination in voting, through, quote, appropriate legislation. The word appropriate until Justice Roberts got involved always meant reasonable, rational, um, very low standard of review by courts, which is what the court held in 1965, right? That's right. Um, and so it only takes it only takes a South Carolina uh, 
you know, a handful of weeks. I believe they yeah. file September of 65, about a month yeah. after the Voting Rights Act passes. They say, well, you know, uh, you can't do that. And effectively what they said is that, you know, Congress is overstating its, 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 its power. Uh, this is a state power. Um, and that they thought they might be able to get away with the same old song and dance that they'd, uh, used on, on this, on this before. Uh, and the chief justice, Earl Warren, um, in an eight, one decision with only Hugo Black and in, in dissent, um, really stepped forth and, and said, no, um, Preclearance is constitutional, and preclearance is constitutional for all of these reasons that Congress needed to do it because for a hundred years you all have had the opportunity to step up and you have shown us what it is you are going. And, and, to do. and when you say step up, let's be clear comply with the Constitution is what you uh, mean. Comply with up. the Constitution. Yes. 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 Um, you know, and, War and, and Warren says, now, listen, Congress took great care here. They they built a long record. We all know the history that there is an insidious and pervasive evil which has been perpetuated in the country. And Warren's phrase is that uh, this insidious and pervasive evil has been perpetuated through unremitting and ingenious defiance of the Constitution. And, you know, I, have, I think that's worth repeating, yes. right? Yes. Unremitting yes. and ingenious sure. defiance. And that's um, what it was. So, that's what it was. Uh, so preclearance wasn't uh, put there because Congress thought that this might be a good idea. Maybe we ought to try this. It was put there because there had been unremitting and ingenious defiance of an insidious and pervasive evil. Okay, one more thing about South Carolina. So in South Carolina versus Katzenbach, 1965, the court 8 to 1 or 7 to 1, 8 to 1, I think, upholds the Voting Rights Act. South Carolina made a bunch of argu arguments. All of them were rejected. One of the arguments they made was you can't treat us differently than other states without some kind of strong reason. Um, and the court's response to that was? Of course we can. <laughs> <laughs> of course we can. That was the actual response. Of course we can. The court said a little more, though. The, when does when does yes. this equal state sovereignty or equal state footing thing come into play? Well, what the court says is 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 that they certainly do have that power. Uh, uh, equal sovereignty and equal footing has to do with when states enter the union. Right. It does not mean that Congress has to treat every state 100% equal 100% of the time. And of course, there have been different requirements put on states even when they did enter the union, right? You, 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 you look at Utah and marriage, um, right. you know, various things that have, have uh, various requirements that have been enforced over the years. Yes. But the point the court made with absolute clarity could Absolute not have clarity. been clarity is this doctrine doesn't apply here. It only applies, if it applies at all, to when states come into the union, which is not this case in any way, shape, or form. So that I wish court, I had it in. I wish I had it in front of me to read because yeah. it's in, the, but it's in the book. It's in the book. It's so it's book. clear and yes. precise that it says yes. this has nothing to do with voting. Right. <laughs> so that's nineteen. So that's nineteen sixty five. And yes. actually, the Voting Rights Act, I think, is successful over time in getting rid of literacy tests and character tests and all the terrible things that mostly in the South, but not just the South, uh, obstacles put in the way of, of people of color voting. All right. So we all agree, the, and even Justice Roberts agrees eventually in Shelby County, that the Voting Rights Act was a tremendous success. It was strong medicine, but it was medicine that was needed, blah, 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 blah. I want to give the audience an example of why preclearance is so important, because prior to the 1965 extension of the vote amendment, prior to the 1965 Voting Rights Act, both individual members of the public and Congress, I mean, the Department of Justice could sue towns, cities, states for voting rights violations. But it was never effective, as you said. They never complied. Judges were reluctant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's why preclearance was so important. Talk about the Mississippi town that canceled an election for overtly racist reasons. 
this story is not from 1965. The story is from 2001. It's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> Modern America, 2001. Um, a little town called Kill Michael, Mississippi, um, probably best known otherwise as the birthplace of B.B. King. Um, but in the belt in Mississippi uh, that was filled with lynchings and, and Emmett Till um, um, over the course of the previous century. Um, and, and Kilmichael, a small town, not much media coverage. Um, slowly, the, the demographics there began to even out 50-50 as far as whites and blacks. Um, and um, there were all sorts of shenanigans played in town. Um, people there told me that they used to get visits from town officials if their trailer was parked someplace, and they would say, no, you're going to have to move that trailer over over here, a block away, maybe, um, so that they would um, be in a different town or a different voting precinct, um, and that that would be enforced. Um, but by spring of 2001, it was clear that whites were about to lose their control over the town council and the and the and the mayor's office in Kilmichael. There was a woman named Mary Young, who was likely to win that spring's election and become the first black mayor of Kilmichael. Um, and so in spring of 2001, just a few weeks before the election, um, they just canceled it. They said, well, <laughs> we're, just, we're just not going to hold this election. <laughs> they got a local court to back up their order. You cannot find any news coverage of this because there really aren't any newspapers there. So there was no way to sort of publicize and 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 shame this. It didn't it it didn't make cable news. I couldn't find a single news story about it anywhere. Um, if 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 the great Robert Duff had Duffy hadn't 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 included it in his in his article on Mississippi and the Voting Rights Act. Uh, in 2006, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have known about it at all, um, and I was able to get Mary Young on the phone, and <laughs> she walked me through the entire story, and it is absolutely shocking. And you, can but how are they and, how are they allowed to cancel it given the Voting Rights Act, the preclearance? Because they were under preclearance at the time. They ignored preclearance. They did not get any permission <laughs> to do this. Okay. Uh, they simply went ahead and 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 canceled it, um, and so. What happened was the Department of Justice caught wind of what was going on, and they sent a letter, and they said, uh, no, no, <laughs> you're under preclearance. You're under preclearance for really specific reasons because of what's happened in Mississippi for the last 200 years, um, and you, A, cannot cancel this election, B, you have to hold it right now, and C, we're going to come, you know, make sure that this is done the right way. And only after DOJ steps in and reminds them of their responsibilities under preclearance, is this election held and does Mary Young finally win? Um, and so if preclearance doesn't exist, they would have gotten away with this. Preclearance yes. stopped yes. them uh, yes. from getting away with this, not in 1965 or 1955, but in, in 2001, right in the middle of our own lifetimes right uh, just before the attack on the world trade center which we right. still think of as, uh, that that is a an, very it's, modern it's, history it's a great part of the book and it's really powerful um i also want to mention i guess since we'll eventually get to shelby county uh that in two that's 2001 and that's mississippi in 2010 alabama there was a uh idea that maybe they'd put a gambling uh, uh thing on on the on the referendum there was a referendum for gambling that the local leaders did not want on the refer on to be voted on, uh, the FBI got involved because there was corruption and stuff like that, and the FBI wiretaped wiretapped uh, Alabama officials in 2010, referring to black people. Part I apologize to the audience for this word, referring to black people as Aborigines, talking about how we don't care about sports, but we can't put this on the ballot because that means black people will vote. It, so that's 2010. That's 10 years later from the story you're talking about. So when Roberts in Shelby County eventually talks about how much better racism has gotten, sure, we both things agree. Things have changed in the South. Yeah, things have changed. They have. Things not have changed so much. in the South. 
not not so much, not that much. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, now we have to detour to 1981, 82, and it's the Department of Justice. The Voting Rights Act has been a success now for what uh, 17 years, give or take. Um, and the issue is, oh, is the voting right a lot of issues? But the main issue is, is the statute going to be amended to prohibit not just intentional discrimination? which is hard to prove despite examples we're giving, is usually very hard to prove intentional discrimination. Um, are we going to limit it to that? Or is effect, discriminatory effect, going to be enough? And almost everybody on the left in 1982 and today thinks that effects should be enough. That was the debate. John Roberts is a young lawyer at the Department of Justice working for Ronald Reagan. What is his position on adding uh, or letting the Voting Rights Act preclude just effects as well hmm. as intent. John Roberts is very much against this. Yes. Uh, John Roberts leads the way in the Justice Department uh, of mounting the challenge um, to this piece of the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. Um, he is a young man. Uh, this is his first job in Washington. He is fresh from having clerked from at the court for uh, Justice Rehnquist. Uh, and he comes over to a DOJ, the DOJ of William French Smith. Um, and it's it's a divided Reagan administration on this on this topic. Um, uh, there were plenty of political people inside the White House, the Michael Deavers and Lynn of the of the world who weren't really interested in 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 fighting over over voting rights act. Uh, they were having political issues. They wanted to I try to make gains in the black community. They were not interested in 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 um, in going against something um, needed as, as American as baseball and apple pie. Uh, yes. It was not their idea of of a political winner. Um, but you had this group in in DOJ, um, really animated by Roberts. Uh, what the memos show is that he is the person who is drafting all of the op-eds, all of the talking points, really forcing this issue um, and and fighting very hard um, for a, a better part of a year, um, crafting all of Attorney General uh, uh, Smith's um, um, uh, uh, speeches on the Hill, running the strategy to try and pick off enough senators to uh, defeat this. Um, also, the, le the left, the, the filibuster was very much in play. So it, it had to be an overwhelming vote. It was very much in play. Uh, yeah. And of course, Helms and Thurmond had used the filibuster quite effectively uh, on civil rights legislation in the past. And so what everybody... Um, when when the Senate agrees on the compromise that is going to allow um, um, the, the, the effects test, um, Bob Dole comes out and very clearly says, I've got 60 votes. And yeah, this, and this is, supposed, is Bob Dole. This is not Mr. Liberal. I mean, this is Bob Dole. And this Dole. is supposed to be a message yes. to others on the right that yes. this fight is over. And even John Roberts does not get that message. Uh, the next day, it's it's John Roberts who's like, they don't know what's in this bill. As soon as the senators find out what this really means, then we will win. We have to keep fighting. Um, and what I think is so important here too, right, is, is that the entire intent versus effects test um, comes out because, um, because of of Mobile v. Bolden. Right. Uh, um, and what the real lesson of Mobile v. Bolden is, is that there was intent and effects there right. in Mobile. Right. And, and Roberts is trying to codify the, the effect test. Um, and <laughs> well, he wants to, he wants to preclude it. He wants to say effects right. are not enough. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, um, in also, reality, looking at that yeah. case, what you have is both, and that right, he right. couldn't see that, or didn't want to, eighty-one, or didn't want to. I think says an awful lot about the way that Robert sees voting rights issues in general, and what still informs him to this day. 
And he, as your book points out, he says that uh, the Voting Rights Act is basically the most intrusive remedy or most intrusive thing the federal government can do to the states or something. Completely oblivious to a century of white people stopping black people from voting. I mean, just completely oblivious to it. As, so, if, okay. it, as if it never right. happened. So that's 1981, 82, 83. Uh, Roberts is, uh, again, to repeat, a young lawyer in the Reagan Justice Department fighting against extending the Voting Rights Act to effects. He lost. It was extended. I am sure I don't have any personal information about this. I don't think you do either. But he is quite, I'm sure he was not happy that he lost that battle. Um, he, gets to the, he gets to the Supreme Court in 2005. Um, and before we get Shelby County, we get this weird case, Northwest Austin. Tell the audience about Northwest Austin. Yeah. I think the lesson of the Voting Rights Act of 82 and the loss there is that the conservative legal movement understood that if it wanted to have wins on cases like this, um, they weren't going to get 51 senators and 218 members of Congress, but it would be a whole heck of a lot easier to get five justices on the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and so the battlefield in many ways really changes um, from, from fighting this through the political process, through trying to control it via judicial fiat. Um, and by 2005, Roberts um, is is on the court. Um, 2008, the nation elects its first black president in in Barack Obama. Uh, and, and 100 days after his inaug inauguration, um, um, well, uh, a case arrives at the U.S. Supreme Court for, for oral arguments, and it is called uh, uh, it's brought by a small water utility district in Northwest Austin. And what they are saying is that, uh, they should be allowed, um, to not be part of, of. Yeah. Yeah. We should, they've, they've, I'm sorry. We should um, talk about that. The, the Voting Rights Act. Up, did, yeah. Yeah. I'll do that. The Voting Rights Act did allow for entities, city, states, whatever, water districts, um, to opt out I'm sorry, to, well, yeah, to opt out of the restrictions if they had proven a good record. We don't have to get into details of that. If they no. had shown they hadn't violated the law for like 10 years or whatever it was, then you could be, you could get, there was, the point is there was a way to get out of preclearance. Okay, exactly. Go ahead. go ahead. And in 2006, the Voting Rights Act is reauthorized. Yes. Um, and it's reauthorized in a bipartisan fashion, 390 to 33 in the, in the House, 98 to nothing, I believe it is in the Senate. Yeah, unanimous, unanimous in the Senate. So, um, and signed by a Republican president, sorry, go ahead, which is further evidence that if the right was going to undermine this, they had to do so via the courts. It was, right. it was not going right. to be done through the, the political process. Um, and the folks who were on the losing side of the reauthorization fight in 2006 were folks like Edward Bloom, um, who were arguing against, against, um, against this uh and bloom uh and and his his friend gregory coleman who we uh the former solicitor general in uh, texas um the former clarence thomas clerk um they find this water district in texas and they say well here's a pretty good test case uh here is this new district um no history of 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 racism they weren't requiring literacy tests and it just seems crazy right if they want to move their elections from bob's garage down to the local school why should they have to fill out a whole bunch of forms and do some paperwork and pay money and wait for the government to say okay they had some common sense on their side so it was it was it was kind of a classic um it was it was kind of a classic case of um bad intentions to go after this act but being being masked by, um, you know, a little bit of, 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 of truth. Um, and so what happens in Northwest Austin is as the case makes its way through, uh, it, it's knocked down every step of the way. Uh, the utility district simply doesn't qualify for bailout. Um, and their, their arguments challenging the constitutionality of preclearance are, are brushed aside at every every step of the way because Congress had developed this sixteen thousand page uh, record in in two thousand and six when it reauthorized uh, 
uh, that made clear that that this was still a rational and proportionate um, response. The preclearance was still needed. Um, and 21, court, he 21, like hearing, 21 hearings. 21 hearings. 21 hearings. 21 hearings, 16,000 pages, yeah. and hundreds and thousands of examples around the country of why preclearance was still needed um, going into this unanimous vote. Uh, and so the judges said, well, there's this record. Uh, this is all pretty clear. Uh, it goes to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, and suddenly it's a whole lot less clear. Uh, and it becomes a whole lot less clear in part because um, because John Roberts uh, decides to go back to who <laughs> go to go back to South Carolina, heavy Katzenbach, and with the help of some editing and a couple of ellipses, uh, he creates this stand this the the, the this brand new uh, tradition of uh, of equal sovereignty among states um david and, i want to i want to i want to yes. pause there so yeah. katzenbach rejected that theory in northwest reject. yeah in northwest austin the court could have and this would have been i wouldn't have agreed with it but it's legitimate they could have said we were wrong we overrule katzenbach and there is a doctrine that congress has to have more than an appropriate reason it must have a strong reason to teach, to treat different states differently. If he does that, you and I would be saying he's wrong on text history, but at least he was honest and, and above board. That's right. Here, he just reverses the decision by leaving out words and replacing them with ellipses. But he here's the part- He cuts out the part he doesn't like and calls it law. Right. And the part he didn't like is this doesn't apply. <laughs> That's the part he didn't like. Um, but there's also reports. The part he didn't like was the part that said he was wrong. Yes. And, the, and then it gets Machiavellian because there's reporting. So the constitutional issue was raised in the case. The court eventually didn't decide it. They said that the, the, the law district could just opt out. Thomas did want to reach the constitutional issue in dissent. Of course. But the, other, the other eight justices didn't. But here's the thing. I think there's reporting that suggests Roberts went to the liberals and said, you sign on to this as is. Or we are going to reach the constitutional issue and strike it down. There's a That's, lot of there's a lot of grubby horse trading going on behind yes. the scenes. But what's uh, amazing about that is that Roberts had the votes. Yes. Roberts had the votes to reach the constitutional issue. Yes. He did not want to undo preclearance in this case. He yes. did not want to do it so quickly. He wanted to take a little bit of a step before taking his big step. But it's worse than that, because when he took the big step, he claims the liberals signed on to his equal state sovereignty thing, which is technically true. But he had blackmailed them to do it. <laughs> what he does here is fascinating and evil. And those two cases alone should have undone Roberts's reputation as a yes. moderate institutionalist yes. centrist, simply calling balls and strikes. What yes. Roberts does here, I mean. He, he's not only umpiring; he's 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 tearing up the rule book and installing his own. He's well, taking the rule book that was handed to him and he's editing out what he doesn't like and replacing it, and then and then saying, "You play the game by my rules, or you're not going to play the game at all, or right. I'll I'll make up even harder rules." He is so commissioner. He is he, he, he is commissioner, umpire, player, and owner. All in one. Yes, <laughs> that's really well put, you know. Um, and so so Roberts is praised for his judicial statesmanship. In, yes. In this piece, the, the New York Times op ed page goes goes nuts. They're like he managed to split the baby here just perfectly. What what a master um, when in reality he was being a master. He was being a master of, 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 of achieving his life's work of undoing the VRA by making it look as if he was doing something else entirely. Um, and so he, so he, he adds this dicta into the Northwest Austin case that he forces the liberals to go along with, or else he would have reached the, the, the constitutional, uh, a, a question two years earlier, right. uh, uh, three years earlier, uh, that says, well, things have changed in the South, and there is this traditional uh, 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 theory of equal standing, and um, we're going to just let the, the the utility bail out here, but we do have concerns about this formula 
and whether it is still applicable. And this is why, as you have said so thoroughly and completely over the years, this is why this court is not a court. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. <laughs> they are being a legislature here. Congress decided these issues in an entirely appropriate way. They did a 16,000 page study over hearing after hearing after hearing. And then you have nine people unelected, unaccountable, behind closed doors, effectively reworking and rewriting this because they think so. Right. Because and, they can. And, and it's even and so really well said. By the way, Dave, audience, David is not a lawyer. You wouldn't know that the way he talks because he knows everything. Right. You, you never went to law school. Right, David? I never did. No. Right. So, um, but, but David is writing. Mom. But you've been writing about the law brilliantly for a very long time. What I want to say is, so so it's unbelievable, really. So the Texas case involves this kind of weird water district that never discriminated, as far as I know, against anybody, anytime, anywhere, any place. What they do is they wait four or five years and then take a case from Shelby County, Alabama, which may be one of the most racist places in America. <laughs> and they take that case. Go ahead. <laughs> I know it's hard. Dave and I are you both know, breathing heavy because it's hard. Um, what nobody appreciates, probably except you and a handful of other people about the Shelby County case, is that it doesn't really start with Shelby County. Right. It starts with a little small town called Calera, Alabama. Uh, and Calera um, is a lot like um, any other sort of growing Alabama town in between Birmingham and Montgomery off the highway. So as people leave the cities and as those cities grow, the, the bedroom communities expand. Um, Calera elected in the early 2000s its first black city councilor in, in forever. Um, there may have been one other one, I, but, so, but not... Right. Very many officials of color in 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 Calera. Um, as soon as that happened, Calera decides that it needs to uh, redistrict. Um, of course, it's Alabama. Um, and what they do is they take the district that had been represented by the the black member whose name was Ernest Montgomery, uh, and they turn it completely inside out. They that this district had been seventy percent black. Uh, when they're done with it, it's seventy percent white. Um, and Montgomery, perhaps not unsurprisingly, loses his next election. But here's here's the funny part. Um, they didn't pre-clear the map. Um, with the and they had to. They were subject to pre-clear. Obviously, Alabama they were, was subject. They were in Alabama. They were subject to pre-clearance. Oh, and by the way, the more than 100 annexations in, in Calera that had grown the size of the city also were not pre-cleared, which, yeah. which needed to be because they affected voting and districts. Um, so the Department of Justice is like, uh, you cannot do this. And oh, by the way, you had to tell us about all these other things. So we're going to have a big conversation here, Calera. Um, they void the, uh, the election. They force a different map to be drawn and Ernest Montgomery holds on to his uh, a seat except Edward Bloom sees this action on the Department of Justice website and Bloom says well here's my case um they the court cannot duck the constitutional questions here right in the same way that they were able to duck the constitutional questions um in northwest austin so David, we are we are approaching the end of this. So, we, um, uh, and and this has been fabulous. But but, but because so, I talk too much. No, you don't. I talk. To, maybe I do. Um, but but we still have a few more minutes. So so the audience, if you're listening to this podcast before, you, we've talked about Shelby County a lot on this podcast. Yes. Um, the bottom line is, so I want to get to the post Shelby County world because yeah. your book is really about how we got to where we are today. Yes. And I do want people to read this book and I want people to understand we are doing the, at best, not even the greatest hits. We're doing just a, a smattering of things to get people interested. So Shelby County comes down five to four, uh, yeah. incredibly 
uh, poor reasoning, and, and they come up with this principle of equal state sovereignty under the Reconstruction Amendments that can't possibly fit the Reconstruction Amendments, which required the South to change all of its practices before coming into the Union and be treated differently anyway. My audience is familiar with the horrors, I think, of Shelby County. So let's finish this with you talking about what happens after Shelby County and the effects really immediately and then up until today. Yeah. Robert says things have changed in the yep. South. That entire case is an example of how things had not changed in the right. South. And the aftermath just continued to show it, right? I mean, if John Roberts truly believed that things had changed in the South when that decision comes down in June of 2013, he really only had to wait about an hour to be proven <laughs> wrong. An hour, it's one an hour. An hour later that Greg Abbott of, of Texas announces that, well, we are now going to enforce our, our very strict uh, voter ID bill which they had not previously been allowed to enact because they were under preclearance. Oh, and by the way, this new act, um, this new voter ID bill, uh, the state of Texas would later admit uh, that uh, they were well aware that it would prevent more than 600,000 Latinos from voting because uh, they were citizens. They just lacked the proper ID that would now be required right. by the state of Texas. And, and North Carolina too, right? Oh, this explodes across all of these states, some of which had been covered under preclearance, uh, some of which had not, uh, some of which had been wildly gerrymandered. Um, but all of these things together, what you begin to see across the South is just this tightening of the noose. Uh, boy, that, that that's, 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 that's. Well, it actually, no, actually. I, I, that's so an David, ugly way to say it. Um, but but, but um, given, given the South. It's the. Yeah, given the lynching history of the South, I think it is a it is an appropriate um, metaphor. Um, it, it's it, what you begin to see is a tightening of the of the rules across the South in such a way as to um, create the electorate that Republicans wanted. Um, so you begin to see voter ID bills that are targeted in order to keep the people who they don't want voting just to make it a little bit harder L lots and lots of ways so maybe if you don't stub your toe you you bang your knee up against the uh, the, the, the next restriction um so it becomes a little bit harder to get an id there's fewer precincts in your neighborhood those precincts might have fewer machines so the lines get a little bit longer um, Actually, da and David, I'm, so I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but, um, you know, I, I, it just hit me, though, as you were beautifully saying that, that this is really, really, really happening in Georgia right now. We are creating, Georgia is creating a electorate, election denying commission to deal with elections, which I don't think they could have done in, under preclearance. Um, that's one example of how. This really could change America the next election because it 100 yeah. percent could. Yeah. Um, I think it's already, you know, it, it, um, all the redistricting maps in these states yes. would have had to have yes. been pre-cleared. So all of yeah. the far right activity that you see, whether it's election denialism or voting rights questions or reproductive rights or writing black history out of the, 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 the school books, all of this can't happen if John Roberts does not undo Preclearance, or it, it certainly would have been, most of it would have been much harder. And I think what's so important, and I'll say this super quick, to, to understand about Shelby County and what happens next is that the states knew that this was coming. They could read the tea leaves and they could read the tea leaves because everybody was working on it together. Yeah. This was the entire conservative legal movement and the right wing coming together in order to create this. So the same people who are creating Shelby County, um, and they're all funded by the same organizations and donors, um, are also the same people who are funding the, the gerrymanders of 2010, they're the same people who fund things like the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, who write the model bills that lawmakers in these states oftentimes 
destroying p- destroying public schools in the process. Yes, they're funding the litigation. They're funding the lawyers. They're funding the Federalist Society who put the judges on the bench who decide these cases. This is a hermetically sealed circle, and that's what you begin to see in Shelby County is it is that this is 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 intentional and this is concerted and this is strategic and it's yeah. not happening by accident it's happening because these funders wanted to and they have figured out how to fund the litigation to put that litigation in front of the judges that they have placed on the bench on the lower courts and on the US Supreme Court and this back and forth between uh the courts and the state legislatures oftentimes funded by the exact same people to sort of pass these laws um that would never pass a referendum it's also uh, the, and also the same folks fighting affirmative action and successfully defeating all of these action. issues it's the yeah. same hermetic circle it's the yeah. same people and this is what the conservative legal movement has really built and this is the real success of what they've done, which I would say is also the, the invidious evil of what they have done, uh, is that they've taken all of these issues out of the political process, That all of these issues that they would lose if it went into the political process, and they have put them into this sealed circle that they've created, the sort of iron triangle of the of the Federalist Society, the courts, the state legislatures, all of it funded by the, the, the same folks. Um, and what we see on voting rights, what we see on reproductive rights, what we see on education, what we see on on masks uh, in, in uh, being worn in a pandemic, all of this is of a piece. Yeah. Uh, and when you start to pick away at the knots of, of, of what has been tied together, you see how elaborately created and built and how intentional it's all been. And let me just say that David's book does tie it all together incredibly well, better than I was able to accomplish today with my questions. But the book is called Anti-Democratic, Inside the Far Right's 50-Year Plot, and it is a plot, to control American elections. If you're interested in how we got here uh, in terms of our both money in elections and the uh, really the denial of voting rights to a whole bunch of people of color, uh, this this is your book. David is an astute observer of American politics. I, I know you've interviewed me many times in the past for, for, for stuff. So I was really happy to have the opportunity to interview you. Uh, thank you for coming on. This book is available starting now, I believe. Um, and everybody should read it, should buy it, and then read it. David, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so grateful for your voice on all of these issues and the inspiration it's been to me. So this is a okay. pleasure.